brief stop at a display that talks about what was going on during the Depression. What were, what were we doing to, to try and stay in business, to be honest with you. Um, and we got a couple, this is interesting, the first white guitar we ever made. Um, but one of the things we did during the Depression was because of feedback from the dealers who said, boy, these guitars are great, they're just too expensive. Isn't there some way you can make them more affordable? And so we said, well, we don't want to compromise on the quality of the materials. We don't want to compromise on the quality of the construction. But we can certainly take off all of the ornamentation that doesn't really affect the sound or the structure. And out of that initiative, we came up with the mahogany top guitars and cut the price in half, 25 bucks. And we sold a lot of them. And people still seek them out today. These four are cool because these were set up, and that, of course, uh, not a mahogany top guitar. These were set up for Hawaiian style playing. What's interesting about this guitar is if you look at our, our uh, archives and you look at the production totals, nobody anticipated the Great Depression. And so we, you know, in the Roaring Twenties, business was really good. So we had fancy guitars in the pipeline that sold out during the Great Depression, but very slowly. These things had been started or been planned, got them into the production, and then it's like, wow, business stopped. And so you'll, you'll see guitars, and if you look at the archives, where it's like it was begun and then it just kind of hung around for a year or two or three until we found a home for it. And by then we were adjusting our production to make more and more of these simpler, uh, more affordable guitars. Okay, wacky inventor. I'm as guilty as my ancestors. I love having conversations with wacky guitar inventors. Um, I've formed some partnerships with some of them. So imagine back in, oh, let's say 1929, someone comes to visit and says, I've, I've got an idea, Mr. Martin. And if you will listen to me, we will revolutionize the guitar because someday all guitars will have little holes around the side. We made four of them. <laughs> Arch tops. We got into it. We forgot to carve the back. Don't ask me why. Uh, and we got out of it. They were hard to build, expensive, and didn't sell well from us. They sold well from other people. Um, the reason we got out of it is in the run-up to World War II, we were put on rations, rations for raw materials, metal and spruce in particular. An arch top took this much spruce, a flat top took this much, we did the math, we said we can get a lot more flat tops out of a hunk of wood than we can an arch top. And every time we procured a tailpiece, we used up some of our metal allotment that meant we couldn't order another set of tuning machines. So we said, let's get out of this business, we can order more tuning machines, to put on flat top guitars and we can have better utilization of the spruce uh, during, the, during the war. But, and we have a nice collection of, of arch top instruments here. This was the top of the line. Back in the day, the most expensive Martin guitar we made, 350 bucks. And we bought it uh, to round out the collection, paid $18,000 for it. This case is dedicated to what we call the golden era. Um, we didn't call it the golden era back then because we didn't know, but uh, in, in looking back, it truly was. And now you, you think, okay, Roaring Twenties come to an end, Great Depression. There was a class of customer that was doing pretty good during the Great Depression. But before we get there, let's talk about this handsome gentleman here. There he is in later life, Perry Bechtel. Perry was a vaudeville banjo player. And he said, I see this vaudeville banjo thing coming to an end. I'm too young to retire, I'm going to switch to the guitar. Unfortunately, every time I pick up a guitar, the neck is very wide, it's flat, and I bang into the body when I try and play it. So he came to us and he said, is there a way you can make me a guitar that has a neck that's more like a banjo neck? And so we borrowed from the arch top, we did not invent, but we borrowed from the arch top, the 14 fret neck, took a 12 fret triplo, squared off the shoulders, put a radius on the fingerboard, built a guitar, showed it to him, and he said, close enough. I like it, I'll take one. And we thought, you know what? Maybe there are other people that will appreciate this slimmer, 
faster neck. And sure enough, they did. And over a pretty short period of time, the company went through a transformation where more and more, particularly of our bigger body guitars, were beginning to be made with the 14 rather than the 12 fret neck. So, who were those customers that were doing okay during the Great Depression? Country and Western stars. Because everybody likes a good song, even when times are tough. And so we found a market there, and one of the things we found was, of all the guitars we made for Ditson, the only one that we kept in the line, Ditson unfortunately went out of business, was the Dreadnought. And there, if, you've looked, if you think back to that little, those little ukuleles we saw, you can see that shape. Influenced by Ditson in a collaboration with us. This is actually an original Ditson. Um, we, we decided to reintroduce it under the Martin brand. Um, Gene Autry, doing pretty well. Um, in, uh, when would it be, 1933, right? Great Depression. Orders a Style 45. Dreadnoughts, and lots of them. Ah, uh, the first and only D42 we made back during the Golden Era for Tex Fletcher. He gave it to us as a gift for our display. The first D28 we ever made. We bought this uh, not that long ago at a Christie's auction. It was uh, prior to being here in Richard Gere's collection. You can see though, it's still 12 fret slot head. This one's cool because it's a transition guitar. It's still 12 fret, but now it's got the narrow neck with the solid head. And then of course, the modern in parentheses, Dreadnought, 14 fret, solid head, this is it, and there it is, the Holy Grail, the, the D45. We made 91 of them, stopped in the run-up to World War II, didn't get back into it for many, many, many years later. These are considered one of, if not the most collectible, style Martin guitars or style guitars. Um, anyone really covets finding one of these somewhere. Um, it's... It, so we needed one for our collection. We didn't have one. And uh, this one came here and, and the fellow that we ultimately bought it from said, this is the guitar you're gonna buy. And I said, how do you know? He said, well, play it. So one of my colleagues played it and I said, oh yeah, oh man, that, that's special. He said, I know, it's special. This guitar was $300 when it was new. That arch top was 350 we paid $18,000 for the arch top. We paid $180,000 for the flat top. 